on October twenty second, eighteen forty one, under the tranquil skies of the Atlantic Ocean, a warship embarked from the port of Genoa and commenced its leisurely journey towards Rio de Janeiro. This frigate, named La Disgenes, belonging to the navy of the Kingdom of Sardinia, had been engaged in trade ventures to South America for several years. However, this particular voyage was distinctive, not merely a routine trade expedition, but a daring experiment. On board, alongside its regular cargo, were 141 barrels of red wine from the Langue region. Vintage 1840. Two years later, samples of these wines would eventually return to the Kingdom of Sardinia with the warship. It was during this journey that the creator of these wines sought to prove to the world, for the very first time, the remarkable aging potential of Langue red wine. Hello, everyone. I'm Zoe, and welcome to my channel Rizzo Gourmet. Today, let's talk about Barolo. Beyond being a wine, Barolo is a municipality known as Comune in Italian, located in the province of Cuneo in the Piedmont region of northwestern Italy. Barolo is situated about 50 kilometers away from Turin, which once was the first capital of Italy from 1861 to 1865. However, when you see Barolo on wine bottles, it represents more than just a geographical location. It signifies a specific type of wine that may not necessarily originate from the exact village of Barolo itself. In fact, some neighboring villages are also capable of producing Barolo wine. We'll talk about it in detail shortly. The eligibility to label a wine as Barolo depends on whether it adheres to the regulations outlined by the Italian wine classification system. This system was introduced in 1963, initially comprising only one category for many years, the DOC, Controlled Designation of Origin. It wasn't until 1980 that the first wines were granted the DOCG status, with Barolo DOCG being one of them. DOCG stands for Controlled and Guaranteed Designation of Origin. This designation represents the highest level of wine classification in Italy, and the Italian government enforces strict regulations governing viticultural and winemaking practices. These rules are used to provide a technical definition of the wine and set Barolo apart from other wine varieties. The classification system was established primarily for safeguarding these wine names from misuse and imitation. Government oversight extends across various critical aspects, with a particular focus on the grape varieties permitted for wine production, the designated grape growing zones, viticulture practices, and winemaking methods. So, which grape varieties make Barolo wine? The answer is. Nebbiolo, Barolo wine is exclusively crafted from grapes sourced from vineyards planting solely the Nebbiolo vine. Nebbiolo is a grape variety with its origins deeply rooted in the Piedmont region. Currently, there are about six thousand hectares of Nebbiolo vineyards globally, with over ninety percent of them growing in Piedmont. Small-scale plantings can also be found outside of Italy, such as Greece, Switzerland, North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Now it brings to the second question: Where can Barolo grapes be cultivated? Here is a map marking all the territories where the Barolo grapes can be grown. There are in total eleven villages within the province of Cuneo, having become the homelands of Barolo. And for viticultural practices, here are the key cultivation rules: the soil to grow Barolo vines must be clay and calcareous. The vineyards should be hilly, 
and at elevations between 170 meters and 540 meters above sea level, with appropriate sun exposure and planting density to ensure grape maturity and the quality characteristics of the wine. The training and pruning tab should be traditional ones, such as the x Bellier with GU pruning system. The maximum yield generally should be 8 tons per hectare and minimum natural alcoholic strength should be 12.5%. However, there is a special case worth to mention which is wines bearing a special mention on the label, with an additional geographical mention, and vinya with related toponyms or traditional names, which are the names approved by the government to distinguish wines from others by their very specific geographic location. But anyway, for these special wines, the rules are stricter. The maximum yield should be 7.2 tons per hectare, and their minimum natural alcoholic strength should be 13%. There are also other special cases, for example, for young vines, or for challenging climatic conditions. But here we won't talk too much about it. If you're interested, you can go to Piedmont government website to check it out. I put the link below in the description. But no matter which case it is, these regulations are in place to ensure grapes attain ideal ripeness, sensory attributes, and aging potential. Now let's talk about the last part, winemaking methods. The winemaking regulations lie on these aspects. The location of vinification, the maximum grape to wine yield before aging and after aging, and aging duration. Typically, vinification and aging should occur within the designated zone of grape cultivation. However, additional areas might be allowed if the producers can demonstrate prior operations validated by the Chamber of Commerce. At the end of alcoholic fermentation and before aging, the grape to wine yield should be maximally 70% which means 70 liters of wine from 100 kilograms of grapes. If it exceeds this yield up to 75%, it will cause a loss of control designation of the excess part of production. Well, if it exceeds 75%, the whole production will lose the controlled status. And at the end of aging, the maximum grape to wine yield is 68%. It is interesting that these winemaking rules are also applied to Barolo Reserve wines. What are Barolo Reserve wines? In Italian wine classification system, reserve is used to indicate wines are aged for a longer period of time than wines that are not labeled reserve. For regular Barolo, a minimum aging period of 38 months is mandated, with 18 months spent in wooden barrels. Barolo Reserve wines should be aged for at least 62 months, with also 18 months of aging in wooden barrels. The territory where Barolo is situated is called Lange, where in the Piemont dialect means hills. Just like its name, the territory is characterized by numerous hills. The practices of viticulture and winemaking in the Lange region can be traced back to before Christ. Viticulture likely existed in this region as early as the 5th century BC when Ligurian tribes migrated here, who were already introduced to grape cultivation by ancient Greeks. However, it was during the Roman conquest of Lange that the region's wine business thrived. Evidence of this can be found in Polenzo, where a tombstone was discovered bearing the title Wine Merchant for the tombstone owner. Lange experienced a decline following the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, and viticultural activities waned during the early Middle Ages. The first known settlement in Barolo has barbaric origins, and according to some scholars, the tubal name derives from the Celtic terms Ba and Ru, meaning low place. Indeed, Barolo is situated at a lower elevation than the surrounding settlements. Viticulture revived in the Lange region around a thousand. During the same period, 
the original nucleus of today's Barolo Castle was constructed as fortifications to defend against nearly a century of Saracen raids. While the exact birth date of Barolo is uncertain, the town was mentioned in the register of public documents of the municipality of Alba in 1200 as Villa Barogli. Barolo's story continued in 1250, when the Faletti family acquired Barolo and the surrounding areas from the commune of Alba, marking the beginning of the legend of Barolo wine. The Falettis, likely of French origin, were an ancient Piedmont family active in the financial field as early as 1110. They were already present in Genoa from 1184, and during the 13th century, the family's main occupation became the loan business. The wealthy family Falettis during the 13th century gradually extended their influence. Amassing approximately 50 significant land holdings in the vicinity of the village of Barolo by the year 1300. In the 16th century, Piedmont, with its strategic location in the northern Italy, was often caught in the crosshairs of larger European powers such as France and Spain, which sought to expand their influence in the northern Italy. Several wars and conflicts happened during this period, severely damaged the Barolo Castle. Fortunately, it was subsequently reconstructed with substantial alterations by Giacomo and Manfredo Falletti. In the year 1730, the Falletti family's Barolo estates ascended to the status of a prestigious marquisate. The first marquis was Girolamo Falletti IV. Little did they know that within a few decades, destiny would bring forth a pivotal figure to the family who would play an essential role in Barolo's legendary tale. To narrate the story of Barolo wine, there are three figures that can be missed: Julia Colbert, Paolo Stangiano, and King Charles Albert. Let's start with Julia Colbert. Julia was born on June 26, 1786, in a noble family in Moravia, France. Inherited a rich legacy with ties to the renowned finance minister Jean Baptiste Colbert. Her early life was marked by the tumultuous backdrop of the French Revolution, during which her diplomat father sought refuge in various European kingdoms before their return to France. This return revealed their ancestral castle in ruins and their lands in disarray. Julia's destiny took a pivotal turn in 1804 when she entered the service of Empress Josephine at the imperial court. It was here that she encountered Carlo Tancredi Falletti, the final marquis of Barolo, and their eventual marriage followed in Paris in 1806. They later resided in Turin and spent their summers in Barolo, where the family still owned extensive holdings. Sometime after moving to Piedmont, Julia took an interest in producing the local wine. During this period, the wine made with Nebbiolo, or the wine now known as Barolo, was simply called Nebbiolo or Nebbiolo da Barolo. The first time that Barolo, albeit a derivative of the name, appeared in a written document as the name of the wine was in 1751, when a group of Italian diplomats with contacts in London established a company to import wines from Piedmont into England with their first shipment of Barolo labeled to the wine. Legend has it that it was Juliet who introduced Barolo wine to the King Charles Albert. Who is the second main character in our story? Charles Albert, known as Carlo Alberto I, reigned as the King of Sardinia and governed the Savoy state from 1831 until his passing in 1849. He is the father of Victor Emmanuel II, who would go on to become the first king of a unified Italy in 1861. King Charles Albert's legacy is inseparably linked to some important moments in Italian history, most notably his role in introducing Italy's first constitution and his active participation in the first Italian War of Independence. 
Back to our story, the legend recounts that sometime in the early 1830s, during one of Julia's frequent visits to the court of King Charles Albert, the king said to her, "Marquis, I've heard remarkable things about your wine. Rumors that it rivals the noblest of French vintages. Yet I've never had the pleasure of tasting it." In the days that followed, a distinctive scent graced the streets of Turin. A cart pulled by oxen, laden with a colossal barrel of wine, made its way to the royal palace. Astonishingly, this procession became a recurring spectacle, repeating itself day after day throughout the year, except for the solemn forty days of Lent. While the absolute authenticity of this tale remains uncertain, one thing is clear: the king's fascination with Barolo wine was genuine. This passion prompted a notable shift within the royal palace's culinary practices. The Savoy's kitchen, in a departure from tradition, introduced a wine list prominently featuring Barolo as a compelling alternative to the customary French wines. King Charles Albert went so far as to initiate his own wine production, acquiring the Verduno Castle and expanding his holdings in Polenzo and Santa Vittoria d'Alba. All with the intention of cultivating Nebbiolo vineyards to craft his own exquisite Barolo. From this point forward, our story brings us to the final main character, Paolo Stagnino. Paolo Francesco Stagnino, hailing from a patrician family in Genoa, had a distinguished military career before becoming an enology expert. His military service included roles in the Genoese Republic's army and later the Sardinian army, where he reached the rank of major general and served as the governor of Forte di Bard. In the 1830s, following his retirement from active military service, Stagnino was firstly employed by Camillo Benzo di Cavour, the later first prime minister of unified Italy. Stagnino's task was to oversee the wines of the family estate in Grinzane, situated in the Langhe region. His expertise in enology was well recognized, earning him membership in Royal Academy of Agriculture of Turin in 1839 and later the Agricultural Association in 1843. Due to his reputation as a wine expert, he was commissioned by King Charles Albert to direct the activity of the sellers of the royal estates in Polenzo. During this era, Piedmont wines were primarily characterized by their sweetness and early consumption. However, a shift towards dry Barolo wines began to emerge around the mid 1800s. While some credit the Marquis Giulia Falletti with instigating this shift in response to the challenges of wine spoilage during transportation, Juliet sought the expertise of the French enologist Louis Uda to manage her winery. Nonetheless, recent findings propose an alternative narrative, suggesting that the advent of dry Barolo can be more accurately attributed to Paolo Stagnino. Who insisted that Piedmont red wines should be dry and well aged, even in the face of resistance from those accustomed to sweeter varieties prevalent at the time? During the years when he collaborated with Camillo Benzo di Cavour in Grinzane, Stagnino authored a significant work focused on the refinement of winemaking techniques, titled "Instruction on the Best Way to Make and Preserve Wines in Piedmont." In this book. He emphatically advocated for completely fermenting local red wines to achieve dryness, and highlighted the importance of closed fermenting vats to prevent impurities and limit air contact during fermentation. The book was originally published in 1835. It turned out a great success, and just two years later, it was reprinted. The book was also reissued in 1884, and more recently in 2003. Undoubtedly, Stagnino played an instrumental role in catalyzing a qualitative transformation within the Piedmont winemaking tradition. Stagnino's unwavering dedication to improving wine quality bore fruit, earning the royal estate's wine high acclaim. It graced the royal court tables, found favor with noble families, and gained popularity among renowned Genoese hoteliers. Yet Stagnino's ambition did not end here. 
He believed that Piedmont should expand its wine market to affluent wine-loving regions. He orchestrated a pioneering trail shipment of his wine to South America, gathering support from key ministries. So returning to the opening scene of the video, the wine produced in Polenzo set sail from Genoa aboard the frigate and arrived in Rio de Janeiro and Bahia in the summer of 1842, receiving widespread acclaim. After nearly two years, in 1843, the frigate returned to Genoa carrying the wine samples slated for Stagliano's inspection. The results were nothing short of astonishing. Tasters declared that the Polenzo wines returned from America not only unharmed, but also greatly improved. In 1846, Stagliano eventually retired at the age of 73, beset by health issues. But his lifelong dedication to wine had already laid the foundations for modern vinification of Piedmont red wines. Yet, the legend of Barolo was far from its final chapter. In 1849, Victor Emmanuel II, the eldest son of King Charles Albert, ascended to the throne as the King of Sardinia. He inherited not only the crown, but also a profound passion for wine from his father. With great enthusiasm, he expanded wine production at the Fontana Freda estate in Serra Longa, which included his cherished Barolo. This wine was not only for his personal enjoyment, but also supplied to all the royal family's residences and estates. However, when Victor Emmanuel passed away in 1878, Fontana Freda faced a founding shortfall from the king's estate. This led to the emergence of his natural son, Emanuele Guerrieri, Count of Mirafiore, an adept winemaker with a business sense. Here we call him his Italian name, Emanuele, to distinguish him from his father. Emanuele established the E. Mirafiore winery, which not only produced wine, but also marketed it, with a particular emphasis on Barolo. In 1887, he made history by opening his estate cellars to the public. Emanuele was a trail pleaser in the wine world, embarking on journeys across Europe's renowned wine regions to refine his winemaking skills and promote his wines. He entered his Barolo into prominent national and international wine competitions, achieving noteworthy success, once again demonstrating to the world the excellence of Barolo. As for the story of Barolo, our journey concludes here. From the 20th century to the present, Barolo has continually adapted and evolved in step with the unfolding course of history. Today, Barolo stands for a prestige quality of Italian wine. A harmonious blend of dark fruits, black truffle, and subtle spices with a sturdy tanning structure. This belongs to the centuries of the craftsmanship of growers and winemakers not only their persistence in tradition, but also those who dare to innovate and constantly pursue improvement. Yet, Barillo's evolution transcends its own story. It serves as a mirror, reflecting the broader transformations within the Piedmont wine industry and the entire region, perhaps even beyond.